Freedom is important from many perspectives. Economists argue that freedom permits the economy to be efficient. By saying that, economists are not denigrating other possibly more important moral grounds for supporting freedom, but we are arguing that uh, freedom, a society based on freedom, can confer economic benefits, benefits having to do with efficiency that are, that are important and that should be recognized. The question is, how is that the case? Why is it that freedom, economic freedom, promotes efficiency? After all, freedom permits individuals to act as they wish, to act almost unpredictably. That's what freedom means. And the more one recognizes the potential of individuals to act in possibly unsystematic ways, the more paradoxical it becomes to make the claim that out of such freedom, out of such apparently unsystematic behavior, there can occur, there can emerge regularities that ensure at least a tendency towards efficiency and the elimination of waste. There is a deep-seated paradox here. Uh, I came across a quote from a non-Austrian economist, a very eminent economist, Vernon Smith, who wrote, as follow, who wrote as follows. The pricing system, how is order produced from freedom of choice, is a scientific mystery as deep, fundamental, and inspiring as that of the expanding universe or the forces that bind matter. There is an intellectual problem here, a challenge, which economists have faced for 200 years, and it has still not been completely solved. We, we as economists, should not believe that, that there is no paradox here. There is a deep mystery here. Uh, how, out of freedom, there emerges order, out of apparent of, of how out of apparent chaos there emerges indeed an orderly universe which guarantees a tendency for coordination. This, of course, is, is Adam Smith's invisible hand, but giving it a name doesn't explain how it occurs. Now, the procedure of standard economics, the procedure of mainstream microeconomics, is to model the economy. That is, it is to abstract from certain aspects of human behavior and to imagine a world in which people were not uns unsystematic, to imagine a world in which uh, freedom is used in a rather systematic way. And in effect, standard economics achieves its results by considering individuals to be maximizing machines who indeed come on the scene with their own independent scales of values, their own scales of preferences, but who, once they come into the scene with these scales of preferences, can be guaranteed to behave in clockwork-like fashion and to interact with others in clockwork-like fashion and by abstracting from the unsystematic character, the unsystematic aspect of human behavior, Standard economics hopes and has to a large extent succeeded in, uh, in, in presenting a, a, a body of, of theory that indeed seems to explain efficiency, seems to explain the pattern in which an economic system can avoid waste. But as I say, there has there's been a price that is paid in order to achieve this, this mode of understanding. And when we understand the price that is paid, I am afraid that we have to wonder whether the price was worth paying. In other words, whether what has been achieved is, is, is satis satisfying and satisfactory. I opened a textbook on uh, intermediate microeconomics the other day, 
And I find that the author, quite frankly, says in this, in this textbook, we are going to assume, make three assumptions. We are going to assume certainty. We are going to assume pure selfishness. And we are going to assume purely calculative, rational behavior. In a world in which everything is known, remember certainty, certainty in the sense in which the textbooks are using it, is a very demanding assumption. Not only do I know what you are going to do, but you know that, I'm going, that I know that. And I know that you know that I know that. Ad infinitum. So it's a very demanding, a very demanding condition which standard economics is making, that everybody knows everything. I would say it is a paralyzing condition. Once you really think into the meaning of assuming that everybody knows everything, that I know what you're going to do, and you know that I know it, once you carry that through to the extreme, you have paralyzed the system in a manner which really, which really uh, is, 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 most, is most unsatisfactory and is most disturbing when we try and apply a model of that kind to the real world. Now, textbooks are perfectly frank. They say we are making these assumptions, not because we really believe they're true, but this is because this is the only way in which we can sort of get a, get a handle on what happens in the, in the real world. Selfishness, it is assumed that each individual is strictly homo economicus in the, in the most uh, crass form of most crass conception of what that means. Each individual is absolutely bereft of any ounce of altruism, of any, anything else except a complete urge for selfish, materialistic uh, consumption and complete rationality. Nobody ever makes a mistake. Everything is calculated down to the T, no impulse, no emotion. Well, there are problems with these assumptions. The problems with these assumptions are that these assumptions confine us. If we are to take these assumptions to their ultimate implications. These, can, these assumptions confine us to a state of complete co mutual coordination. That is to say, they require us to perceive the economic system as one in which every single decision is already pre-reconciled with every other single decision being made in the system. Now, there is a, 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 it is a very impressive intellectual feat to develop in detail, to develop in conceptual detail exactly what an economy would look like, where indeed every single decision was completely coordinated and fully dovetailed with every other decision. But when we ask, how does this relate to the real world? What we, have to be, what we have to recognize is that the, this, these assumptions confine us to the intersection point of the supply and demand curve for each market, not in equilibrium only, but in equilibrium always. That is to say, we are confined to understanding the real world as always being, always, in full coordination. So that if you see something in motion, if you see somebody on his way to mail a letter, there's no, equil there's no disequilibrium there that I have to get to mail the letter because I, because I, haven't, uh, because I haven't yet uh, completed my goal. I am exactly where I have to be exactly where I have to be. Every moment of, the, of, of, of time, every individual is exactly where he or she has to be. And to be a bit closer to the mailbox would, be, would have been inefficient, because that would have meant that I would have had to, had to run a bit faster. You see. And every single decision is completely dovetailed with every other single decision at every possible moment of time. 
There are no mistakes. There are no discoveries. There are no surprises. And there is no explanation. Because in a world where knowledge, mutual knowledge, is incomplete and has to be incomplete, the great challenge, the intellectual challenge that faces us is how individuals who are free, individuals who are not centrally controlled, how they manage to generate economic order through their free activities. This is the mystery that Vernon Smith pointed out. It is a deep and profound mystery. How does order emerge out of freely, a mass of freely made decisions where knowledge is imperfect, where emotions have their part to play? In particular, and I have a, an ax to grind here, in standard economics, there is no room for the entrepreneur. There is no room for the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is an individual who is characterized by boldness. He is characterized by, a, by vision, by hunch. These are the raw materials of entrepreneurial success or failure. And surely when we think of these of these matters, of boldness, of impulse, of hunch. Surely they seem to render the, the possibility of systematic, determinate chains of events remotely unlikely. Because we are in the hands of entrepreneurs who are unsystematic by the very definition. So in order to perceive regularities amidst the apparently chaotic vagaries of real-world entrepreneurial volatility, it seemed to mainstream economics that it was a methodologically valuable ploy to imagine away the entrepreneur. And in standard economics, there is no entrepreneur. There can be no entrepreneur. Because in a world in which all decisions have been completely coordinated, there is no opportunity for profit, there is no opportunity for loss, Everybody knows everything. If everybody knows everything, there is no room for any entrepreneur who can think that he knows something that other people don't know. Everybody knows everything. And everybody knows that everybody knows everything. So we have this bizarre, this bizarre circumstance that standard economics proceeds to try and understand how a market works by deliberately excising from, the, from, the, from their models, those individuals who are, after all, the central figures in a market economy. How can you analyze a market economy by imagining that there are no entrepreneurs? It is, it is I believe, bizarre. And yet that is the way in which uh, mainstream economics proceeds. It's as if we are saying, that you want to understand the real world, you can ignore entrepreneurs. You can imagine that what they do can be sort of filtered out. It's true that entrepreneurs act on hunches. It's true that entrepreneurs are bold. It's true that the headlines in the business pages every day are telling us about bold new moves by entrepreneurs. But that doesn't matter. You can ignore that. That's just headlines. You can filter that out. And the real important, the really important determinants which ensure coordination are what happens when you filter that out. And it's the fundamentals which, in, in effect, generate the order that we, uh, we see. We see order. We observe order. Empirical, empirically, we observe order. We see that. The market works. You don't need... You don't need faith in the theory to see that the market works. You need a theory to understand how what we see is true. And uh, standard economics proceeds by providing an explanation which gets off the ground only after it carefully deletes all of those activities which are the most obvious and most visible activities in the real economic world. What I shall argue, of course, is that a uh, sounder approach to economic understanding is to proceed exactly from the opposite direction. And I am, I am 
I won't say I'm exaggerating, but I am emphasizing the distinction between an Austrian approach, an entrepreneurial approach, and the mainstream approach. I am emphasizing that distinction, not because I believe that the mainstream theory has no value. I think it has great value, enormous, enormous value. But I think that that value is reduced when the line is muddied that separates a mainstream approach from an Austrian entrepreneurial approach. And I think for the purposes that we are here this evening, understanding the paradox of order out of chaos, it is important to emphasize rather than to smudge that line of distinction. And the paradoxical truth that I will try and develop here this evening is that the explanation for economic order is to be found not by filtering out the unsystematic activity, apparently unsystematic activity of the entrepreneur, but just the opposite. The explanation lies strictly and purely in understanding what entrepreneurship means and what it does. And yes, there is order in a market system. And the source of that order is entrepreneurial activity. And this simply, this simply underscores the paradox that we are discussing this evening. Well, how is it then that precisely the unsystematic activity of bold, impulsive, uh, visionary, imaginative entrepreneurs, how is it that it's it is precisely their activity, which I believe uh, can be uh, called upon to explain and account for the coordinative properties, the orderly properties in a market economy? Now, the short answer, we'll develop a little bit more detail, uh, this answer. But the short answer is that what seems to be unsystematic is because we observe the entrepreneur from the outside. We observe the entrepreneur without seeing what the entrepreneur sees. The entrepreneur sees opportunities. We don't see them. If we saw them, we'd be the entrepreneurs. <laughs> As I say, I teach, I teach about entrepreneurship, but if I could see what entrepreneurs were doing, I wouldn't be teaching entrepreneurship. <laughs> I'd be the entrepreneur. So we, and I use this in the, in the sense of, of observers of the social scene who remark on the unsystematic character of entrepreneurial activity, we see this activity from the outside without seeing it from the, from the perspective of the entrepreneur himself or herself. Entrepreneurs act in a very systematic way. They see opportunities and they grasp them. Nothing unsystematic about that. But to see entrepreneurs, excuse me, but to see opportunities requires a very special kind of vision, entrepreneurial vision. And that requires that the entrepreneur act in ways which others who have not seen what the entrepreneur is seeing, requires that the entrepre entrepreneur act in ways which would seem unsystematic, would seem impulsive, would seem, uh, seem to be disorderly uh, from the point of view of the outsider. There is method in entrepreneurial madness. What seems to be unsystematic and without method turns out to be easily understandable. Once one recognizes what an opportunity consists of, where an opportunity comes from, what creates an opportunity, and what the role of seizing an opportunity is in achieving order. I would put it this way. Opportunities are created by errors. Opportunities are created by absence of perfect knowledge. If everybody knows everything, there are no opportunities left. Nobody who knows everything is going to act in a way that will leave a known opportunity unseized and ungrasped. So by by postulating certainty and perfect knowledge, one is excluding the possibility of discovery of opportunities. But we have to start the other way. We have to recognize that we live in a world of uncertainty. We live in a world of, of, 
of imperfect knowledge. Not merely imperfect knowledge in the sense that there are books in the library that I have not read, that I know that I have not read. Because those books that I have not read, the mainstream economists can, can understand that too. He understands that there are books that it doesn't pay to read. The cost of reading them makes it not worthwhile to read them. So I know there are languages that I haven't learned. I know there are important sciences that I have not mastered. Because time is scarce, life is short, and consequently we don't memorize all of the numbers in the telephone book. We are ignorant of telephone numbers. Who cares? We are optimally ignorant. We know exactly the number of telephone numbers that it's worthwhile remembering, and the rest we know where to look them up if we'll need them. Standard economics can grapple with that. There's no problem. Imperfect knowledge that's relevant to our task means imperfect knowledge that we don't know that we don't know. Imperfect knowledge means that there are opportunities out there that I would have grasped if I would have known them. I would have grasped if I would, if I would have known how to achieve them, but which we do not know that, that they exist. That is the kind of imperfect knowledge that we have to grapple with. We have, to, we have to deal with the phenomenon, the central phenomenon of the human existence. That is that we don't know what's behind us. Not simply that we know there is something we haven't read, but we don't know what there is there. That's the, that's the human condition. We don't know what's behind us. And we don't know how rapidly to look around. We don't know whether it should be revolving all the time. And even if we do revolve, we don't know for sure what it is we've noticed and what it is we haven't noticed. When you walk down the street, millions of images impinge on, your, on, on the retina of your eyes. Not all of them register. You don't notice everything. You see everything, but you don't notice everything. How many of us have paid any, any attention to the pattern of the floor? We haven't noticed everything. We can't. We can't. That's imperfect knowledge, that we haven't noticed everything. And there are things that we, we don't know that we don't know. And once we recognize that there is this kind of imperfect knowledge, the, the ubiquity of error is, the, is a phenomenon of the world that we cannot assume away. It's central. It's a central phenomenon of the world. The world is, is saturated with error. Without blame. What we don't know, we don't know. What we don't know that we don't know, we certainly don't know. <laughs> we certainly don't know. Now, there are two kinds of error. I think it will be helpful if we classified error into two kinds. There are over-optimistic errors and over-pessimistic errors. Let's talk about over-pessimistic errors for the time being. And I will, if you will bear with me, I will explore a limited, a limited uh, bit of economics with you. If there are two markets, uh, room A and room B, this is room B. In room A, there is a, there's a market. In room B, there's a market. And there are people there, willing there, to pay high prices for a commodity which I have. But I'm not aware that there's a market there. I'm not aware that there are prices there that are higher than I, I, can, I, can, I can sell my goods for here. I will be selling goods here for a price that is lower than the price I could have gotten. I'm over-pessimistic. Why do I sell here? Why do I sell for 10 when the price over there is 20? I sell for 10 because I believe that 10 is the highest price I could get. I wouldn't sell for 10 if I could think I could get 20. Not because I'm selfish, but because I'm purposeful. And the reason why I'm selling is because I have purposes in mind. Selfish purposes, maybe, but maybe altruistic purposes. It's irrelevant. Maybe I want, to, I want to sell the goods in order to support a hospital. Whatever it is, I'm not going to sell them for less than the highest price. And if I think that if I'm selling for 10, that is evidence that I think that the highest price I can get is 10, not, not more than 10. But in fact, there are people there paying 20. I'm over pessimistic. Conversely, the people who are paying 20 in the next room, they're over pessimistic. They would never pay 20 if they knew that, they, that there were sellers in this room selling for 10. Why are they paying 20? Because they're unaware. They're over pessimistically unaware. They believe 
They believe that the lowest price at which they can buy the commodity is 20. That's why they're paying 20. Over-pessimism generates the phenomenon of two prices. Two prices for the same commodity. Now, a great British uh, 19th century economist, William Stanley Jevons, developed what came to be called the law of indifference, which means that there is a that there is a law which argues that there must be a single price for the same commodity throughout the market. Now that is true as a result of the market activity, but certainly there can be more than one price for the same commodity when you recognize the possibility of over-pessimistic error. Over-pessimistic error generates the phenomenon of more than one price for the same commodity. But this error, this over-pessimistic error, that resulted in more than one price for the same commodity, by that very token, this is where the marvelous mystery of the market begins to unfold, begins to open up. That error generates a profit opportunity. Those errors, the over-pessimistic errors, have resulted in two prices, which means it is now possible to buy at 10 and sell at 20. Error has generated a pure profit opportunity. A pure profit opportunity has the capacity to attract entrepreneurial attention. Entrepreneurs have antennae. They can smell profits around the corner. And we are all entrepreneurs. That's something that uh, my great teacher, Ludwig Gomesis, emphasized. All human action is entrepreneurial. All human action involves guessing what's around the corner to some extent, because we live in a world of uncertainty. We live in a world in which the future is unknown. We live, in, we live in a world in which we don't know what it is about the future that we don't know. So we are all acting by taking stabs at what the future may hold. And we all have this sense. That's what to be human means. To be human means to have the sense of somehow sensing what is around the corner. So the, the two prices which result from the over-pessimistic error, generate a profit opportunity which attracts attention, entrepreneurial attention. Entrepreneurs move in to buy at 10 and sell at 20. And what happens when, when they do that? The price where it was 10 rises. The price where it was 20 falls. So Jevons was right after all. There is a tendency for a single price to emerge. Not, not because we start out by assuming perfect knowledge. Well, of course, if you assume perfect knowledge, it can only be one price. Who is going to pay, to pay 20 if someone else is, is selling for 10? Who is going to sell for 10 if someone else is, is, paying, is paying 20? So if you start out by assuming perfect knowledge, if you start out by assuming we all live in glass houses and we know exactly what everybody else is doing and we know that everybody else knows what everybody else knows, etc. at infinitum, then you are frozen, paralyzed into a situation where there can never be more than one price. But if you recognize the role of error, you begin to recognize that the market contains a marvelous, self-operating, autonomously operating system which sponges up information on these kinds of over-pessimistic error and transforms, and transforms the market into, into the, the coordinative direction, moves the market in the coordinative direction as a result of what? as a result of the entrepreneurial vision. What was responsible for bringing one price out of two prices? What was responsible for generating the correction of these errors? Entrepreneurial vision of a pure opportunity that was generated by error. This is what, this is what drives the market, what drives the prices together, what, what guarantees a tendency for prices to move towards each other is entrepreneurship. It's not that you can understand the market by filtering out entrepreneurship. You can only begin to understand the market when you introduce entrepreneurship. Then you begin to understand how the market works. When one recognizes this simple, the simple elements of economics, and I recall, and it was in 1960, I believe, at a conference at New York University uh, where Hayek and Friedman and a number of others were there. I believe Leonard was there at that time. 
I remember at that time Hayek pointing out to the law of the single price as being the single most important economic law of all. And that made an impression on me. And I think it's, I think it's absolutely correct. Because when you understand what the law of single price means, and you understand how far-reaching it is, it doesn't only apply to apples being sold in, in, in room A and apples being sold in room B. It applies right across the market, where you're talking about resources moving from one industry to another, where you're talking about labor migrating from one part of the country to another, where you're talking about entrepreneurs snapping up uh, scarce resources and bidding them away from other industries. You are talking about two prizes. You are talking about entrepreneurs who recognize that you can buy steel in one part of the country and put it to work in construction in another part of the country and make a profit. What in fact is occurring is that, that the entrepreneur is sensing the, the presence of two prices for the, same, for the same ton of steel, two prices for the same barrel of oil. If oil is currently being used in processes of production that are of less value to consumers, the price, entrepreneur, price pre presently being paid for that oil is less than the price which the visionary entrepreneur who recognizes uh, the, 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 the error who is it's less than the price that he will be willing to offer for the oil to, trans, to, to, to transfer it to the more valuable industry where consumers are, being, are, being willing to, are willing to pay higher prices for the product of that oil. So resources move across the country, move across the economy in response to entrepreneurial vision. What is it that they are, that they are seeing? They are seeing two prices for the same commodity, two prices for the same resource, two prices for the same, for the same uh, person hour of labor, two prices for the same ton of steel, two prices for, this, for the same, uh, for the same uh, weight of cement. This is what moves resources. Entrepreneurs don't have to be central planners. Entrepreneurs in, in, uh, in exercising their wholesome and corrective activity do not have to be thinking about anything else about, other than grasping opportunities for pure profit. But in so doing, what are they doing? What are they, in fact, doing? They are identifying errors that have been made, over-pessimistic errors that have been made, where resources were used in, in, in industries that are of less importance to consumers than the other industries where these resources might have been put more valuably to work. What about the other kind of error? Over-optimistic errors. Over-optimistic errors are much easier to understand. An over-optimistic error is, for example, where sellers believe that they can sell for 30. Now, if everybody believes you can sell for 30, and buyers believe that the price is going to be 30, the price will be 30. But, but, over-optimism means that sellers believe that at a price of 30, they can sell as much as they would like to sell at 30. And they may be wrong. It could be that the eagerness of buyers to buy a particular, a particular a product at 30 is much less intense than the sellers had believed. So sellers are holding out for a high price because they're wrong. They're making a mistake. They overestimate the willingness of buyers to buy. Or it could be that buyers are insisting on a low price because they overestimate the eagerness of sellers to sell. In each of these cases of over-optimistic error, this error is corrected much more easily. Much more easily. Because you soon, you soon discover how wrong you were. You soon discover that you were over-optimistic. You don't need to see something which other people haven't seen. You simply have to face reality. You're left with unsold goods on your shelves. You realize that you're asking too high a price. You, you were standing online expecting to be able to buy at five, and long before you reached the, you reached the counter, all the goods had been sold. You realize that the eagerness of sellers to sell is not as great as you thought it was. You thought there would be more goods forthcoming at the price of five. And what do, and what do people do when they realize they've made mistakes? Well, they revise their anticipations. If you've been over-optimistic, you revise your anticipations downwards. If you're a seller who's been asking to, hoping to get a too high a price, you lower the price that you ask. If you're a buyer, you raise the price that you offer. And what happens in, as a result of this? Prices that are too high tend to fall. Prices that are too low tend to rise. What is responsible for this? Error. What is responsible for the correction? The discovery of error. 
So both with respect to over-optimism and over-pessimism. And we're going through some very elementary economics, as you can see. But we're going through it with a special emphasis on the, on the importance of departing from the fundamental assumptions of mainstream economics. We can get to first base in this elementary economics only by denying the assumption of certainty. Only by denying that errors are not made. Only by denying that opportunities don't exist. It's only because errors are made. It's only because, because uh, knowledge is imperfect, utterly imperfect, in the sense that we don't know what we don't know. Only because of that are there opportunities that are not grasped. Only because of that are there, is there scope for entrepreneurship. And it is only because, of there, is, because there is scope for, for entrepreneurship that there is indeed a systematic market process whereby errors are dis tend to be discovered and corrected. This is the entrepreneurial view of the market process. So once again, the paradoxical result uh, emerges that the order that we perceive in a market, the tendency for prices to converge, not merely to converge to one price, but to converge to the price that clears markets, the market clearing price, the tendency towards a market clearing price, which emerges spontaneously in a market, emerges only as a result of the errors that are made and discovered by profit-seeking entrepreneurs. Is there paradox? Maybe. Maybe. But we can understand the solution to the paradox. Order emerges from the vision by entrepreneurs. And to the outsider, I repeat, to the outsider, this vision seems to be unsystematic. It's recognizing where other people have made errors. It's recognizing what other people have not seen. It's recognizing what is around the corner, which, which nobody else sees. That is what is at the root of the market process, of the entrepreneurial market process. And this is the solution to the paradox, order out of chaos. Are there potential problems with such a with such a starry-eyed view of the market? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. And I, uh, in on all honesty, I must never forget that my, uh, my uh, late eminent colleague, Ludwig Lachmann, used to emphasize the risks that, in, that entrepreneurial activity may frustrate the anticipations of others. And economists have have debates on this. Economists do have debates as to the extent to which entrepreneurial activity in one part of the market can be relied upon systematically to correct all errors, or to the extent to which such activity may in fact frustrate the vision of other entrepreneurs. So I don't want to overemphasize, I don't want to exaggerate the coordinative uh, capacity of markets. But we see that markets do coordinate. Our problem is not to, to predict whether or not markets will coordinate. We see that markets coordinate. We see the enormously intricate division of labor, where without central direction, great cities get fed. That was Bastiat's example. How does Paris get fed? Great city of Paris. Enormous quantities of food converge on Paris. Who ordered them? Who arranged it? Who managed to make sure that there is a reasonable, uh, reasonable configuration of exactly those kinds of foods that the citizens of Paris need in any particular day? The enormous complexity of modern economic life and the enormous prosperity of modern economic life tells us that coordination occurs. And the great mystery, as Vernon Smith put it, the fundamental scientific mystery is to explain how on earth such coordination can occur. And the solution is that coordination occurs through entrepreneurial activity, where entrepreneurial activity is profit motivated. The motivation for pure profit, not selfish necessarily, or maybe selfish, not important. It's purposeful. People pursue profits where they see them. Because where profits permit them to achieve their own purposes, whatever they are, altruistic, selfish, or whatever. 
And this is the driving force of the market. And this is what brings about the tendency towards coordination. Let us return to the question of economic freedom. I'd like to, I'd like to contrast once again, the picture of the world painted by standard theory on the one hand and the picture of the world painted by an Austrian entrepreneurial approach on the other in terms of, in terms of what it says about freedom. What the standard picture tells us, and, and once again, let me add as a footnote here, I do not wish to be understood to denigrate the importance and the value of mainstream economics. There are, there are important problems, important workaday problems of economics where the assumptions of the textbooks are highly useful. When Mises used to talk about the consequences of rent control, he was a mainstream neoclassical economist. He was assuming equilibrium. But if one wants to understand the operation of the market, if one wants to understand how markets coordinate, if one wants to solve this fundamental scientific mystery of how order emerges out of chaos, we need an entrepreneurial approach. And once one recognizes the role of the entrepreneurial approach and the role of entrepreneurial competition, I, I use the word competition because entrepreneurs are inspired to see by what they feel breathing down their necks, the competition of fellow entrepreneurs. That inspires people to notice. That puts people on their toes. None of us, none of us is as active and as alert as one, as, as one is, had it not been for one's, for one's very well-grounded fear that there are others who will grasp the opportunities that lie before one's nose. So we are pressed to be, to be we are pushed to be alert, to notice to what is in front of us by competition. And competition simply means absence of privilege. Competition simply means freedom of entry, that no one should be barred from pursuing an opportunity which he or she perceives. This is what we mean by competition, not, not anything that has to do with textbook perfection of competition or anything like that. Competition simply means absence of privilege. Now let's consider the implications of all this for economic freedom. The picture of the world painted by a neoclassical mainstream textbook is that if we all know everything, if we are all captured and molded in a way, we are all imprisoned as it were in a, in a scene where every decision that we make has been pre-reconciled with every decision that every other participant makes, then under those circumstances we are led as if by an invisible hand to do what is efficient and what is somehow good for society. But let's just think about that for a moment. What does that mean? That means that if everybody is already put in the right place, freedom will result in people being in the right place. That doesn't sound very interesting at all. In fact, it sounds almost trivial. It's telling us that if, you, if people have already been told you can be free to do whatever you want, provided you do that which you, would have been, which you would have done had everybody known everything, including yourself. What is, what is the value of such freedom? What is, what is the importance? To the, what is the economic importance of saying we don't need a central direction? Whereas, if one understands, as Austrian economics does understand, that the coordinated properties of the market arise out of the free decisions of entrepreneurial participants, not just big entrepreneurs. Each one of us, as I, as I quoted from Mises, each one of us is an entrepreneur. If each one of us is permitted to pursue the opportunities which he or she perceives, if we are permitted to see and to gain by what we think we see that we, we think we see, if we are permitted to do that, we will be led as if by an invisible hand to see the errors that have been made. We will be led, we will be pushed ourselves to reduce the number of errors we make, such errors consisting in overlooking opportunities, such errors consisting in, in over-optimistically expecting things that cannot happen. We will be led as if by an invisible hand to be alert to what others are able to do and to what others are able to permit us to do. 
And this is what, this is, what is responsible for the tendency to, to efficiency. Once again, there are no doubt profound moral, ethical reasons to celebrate a society of free individuals. The economist has a very modest role. The economist's role is to show that by permitting individuals to pursue what they think they see, we are, encu we are encouraging a prosperous society, a society in which individuals can achieve the goals that they wish to achieve, whatever those goals may be. Then, if one recognizes this, one understands the role of freedom in a way which I believe can make a real and genuine contribution to the kind of society that we want to live in. And I thank you very much.